my name is Nadim. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of Nakat for inviting me here and creating this platform to talk about culture in a critical way and bring us all together. Um, so my copy-paste for the day is going to be in the world of comic books. And I'm going to look at specifically how Western comics are translated into Arab marketplaces. And at this moment of translation, how it is both a site of violence, a Trojan horse, and conversely, a moment of conversation between cultures. So when you talk about comic books, people usually think of these three uh, areas as where comics are most prevalent. And I kind of put up the most relevant of each region. So you have the United States as you know, hegemon, super protector of the world, and that's how they envision themselves. And you have characters like Superman and superheroes coming out post-World War II and during World War II. Then you have Europe with characters like Tonton, um, who are every everyday people in extraordinary situations. And then you have uh, cultures like Japan with manga, who uh, the, the hyper focus on technology and creating characters such as Astro Boy, a robotic child. But my main question starting my research is, what's the equivalent of this in the Middle East and North Africa? Who is the Algerian Astro Boy, the Tunisian Tintin, or the Syrian Superman? Um, throughout my research uh, over the last five years, I found a tremendous amount of work in the Middle East in comic books. And uh, I would love to talk to any of you about this another time, but we found, I've, I've found comics dating back to 1922 um, and going till today, and plenty of Arab children's comics. So when I first started doing my research, I started seeing two distinct eras. Uh, two distinct regions in, in the Arab comic marketplace. The top line of translated comics and the bottom of original comics. And the first way I read this, you know, and I would kind of conceptualize it and write about it, is that the original comics are really where we have merit. We have original art being created in the Middle East. And the copy-paste happening above it of the translated comics is a site of violence. Um, so... Looking at, looking at these two eras, the, my original conception was from 1920 to 1950, everything's gravy, we're looking good, we have all these original comic book creations, there's some translations happening. But then, um, kind of looking 1960 beyond, we start having so many translations of these established Western commodities, and it kind of preempted the ability for Arab comics to create their own art, stable of artists, and, and it was so much cheaper to translate already created Western comics that it was kind of functioning as a Trojan horse. So there is a two sides of violence here from 1960 onward is how I saw it. One, that we were translating a lot of already established Western products into Arabic. And second, the message within those. So that's how I'm going to kind of break it down for you. Um, first, I'm going to look at how that translation of, Arab com of American comics into the Arab marketplace uh, functioned as a Trojan horse. And second, I'll look at how it's actually more nuanced than that, and there was actually conversation happening between the cultures throughout it. So first, talking about Trojan horse. So in this, I want to look at how Islam and Arabism functions in Western comics, and how that's problematic in the way that it gets translated back into Arabic for Arab audiences. And while we're doing this, I want us to look at a couple things here. First, the intended audience. Who are these comics designed for? Second, I want to look at how Arab men are angry, how women are repressed, and how there's a regional unspecific unspecificity throughout all of these comics when we're talking about the Middle East. Um, and let's start with Mickey Mouse. So here, here is kind of, for me, is a fundamental problem with it. You see Mickey as Arab, as performed throughout these translations. Um, Mickey Mouse has had a very storied uh, history of translation into the Arab market. Um, and the problem is, is while these, so we had original Arab artists creating new covers for Mickey Mouse, imagining him as an Arab, but, oh, and, and here's one for the audience. This is uh, Mickey's Kuwaiti. I'm, I'm sure it resonates with you, and it sums up your whole identity in one photo, right? Um, so there you have Mickey as a Kuwaiti. Uh, the problem is, is while these comics, the covers were different, and they were locally Arabized, so children are reading it and saying, Oh, this is my Mickey. This is my Kuwaiti Mickey. Of course. He's a Kuwaiti character. The insides of the comics were the just translated Western comics as they were created without anything being changed except the script. 
So there is a book called How to Read Donald Duck, and they talk about um, Donald Duck and, and the, the kids, the Huey, Dewey, and Louie, going to different regions and kind of recreating American imperialism throughout. So this is in South Africa. And here you encounter the native as, as infantile and the idea that they're helping, the they're helping them, the childlike native, and in return they're getting paid money. This happens in the Middle East, Taban. Uh, here we have uh, the ducks going to Egypt, and Uncle Scrooge gets tired, and he sits down in the desert, and what does he sit on? A new undiscovered pyramid that the Egyptians themselves couldn't discover. And in that, he starts thinking about, oh, man, there must be money in here that a pharaoh put in it. And he hires these unnamed Disney Arabs to dig up the pyramid. And, of course, it belongs to him because he found it, finders keepers. And this, this is, for me, a quintessential uh, American exceptionalism. We can find stuff that the locals couldn't, and we're entitled to it. But there's no gold in it. Um, next, we'll look at Superman, or as he becomes in Arabic, Superman. Um, so Superman is also deeply problematic uh, in terms of how it talks about the Middle East. Uh, this is where we're talking about the uh, regional unspec unspecificity. Because Superman, and in the entire DC universe, they make up a Gulf country for, uh, that stands antithetical to the human rights that Superman stands for, and that is the auspiciously named country of Karak. <laughs> um, so I'm going to look at uh, an example of Lois Lane confronting the Prime Minister of Karak for an interview. She goes to the Prime Minister and says, you agreed to give the planet, I don't do a good Lois, so I'm just going to, Lois is going to sound like me today. Um, I agreed to give the planet this interview, Ms. you agreed to give the planet this interview, Mr. Minister. I'm sure my readers will want to know why you're backing out of it now. You don't have something to hide, do you? And he says, not at all, Miss Lane. It is just that I did not expect your newspaper would send a woman. You have a problem dealing with women? Of course he has a problem dealing with women. He's from Karak. <laughs> Indeed not, in their proper place. The females of Karak know that place, unlike their American cousins. How dare she? Well, welcome to the 20th century, pal. Later, of course, he kidnaps her, and she says, hey, what's the idea? I'm an American, you can't, uh, with the idea being that her passport affords her a certain amount of dignity that the, her Karaki cousins would not be afforded. Um, but I just have, Miss Lane. As I have said in Karak, we know how to treat our women. So the problem with this, again, is it's being translated back into Arabic for Arabic children to read. Um, here you have an example of an original action comic, Superman, being translated into Arabic. And not only was Superman translated um, literally, Superman became Neil, Nabil Fauzi. Clark Kent is Nabil Fauzi, and he is protecting the Arab metropolis. Um, finally, for an exa example of the Trojan horse model, we'll look at Tantan. So, Urge, the creator of Tintin, was really fascinated with the Middle East. He sent, uh, <laughs> my childhood too, um, he sent uh, Tintin to the Middle East more than any other uh, geography in, in the world. Um, so, Tintin returns to the Middle East four times. The first two times, pre-World War II, um, he goes to Egypt and Morocco. Subsequently, he goes to the Urge version of Karak, which is called Hamad. It's again a fictional Gulf country. Um, and Land of the Black Gold and Red Sea Sharks. And this was because post-World War II, he was sensitive. Uh, he, was being, he was accused of being a Nazi supporter and was very sensitive to... Um, he, he thought that making up an Arab country would be less offensive than sending him, them to an uh, actual geography. So here's an example of uh, early Tintin. This is in Egypt again. Um, Tintin is wandering through the desert and he hears uh, a, a poor white woman yelling, mercy, pity, and he goes into the scene, and what does he see but two heavily dressed uh, uh, Muslim Arab men whipping this white woman, and here he says, brutes, and he's ready to come and fight. Oh, that's not how you hold a gun. I don't know, that's not effective. Um, for me, when I, when I see that panel, it reads like a classic Orientalist painting evoking the idea for the, the you know, the white savior complex, the need that we need to save these um, nubile women from these heavily dressed savage Arab men. They're innocent, and so there you have the slave market. But the difference is, is the white man's burden is embodied with Tintin jumping into frame. So there we are in relation to this scene. Elsewhere, Urge did not bother to learn Arabic. 
So we have squiggle Arabic, which is pretty offensive in my mind. And you have characters saying things like, by the beard of the prophet, I will get you this time. I have not been in a desert shootout personally, but I don't think that's what the person would say. It doesn't really seem regionally appropriate. Um, and then, of course, we have women constantly in the cob, scribble Arabicing away, and the classic trope of uh, Western trope that you see in many um, Western products, such as like Sex in the City and all that, um, of, of men dressing in the cob to hide their identity on the chase. I'm sure you've seen this in other uh, mediums as well. And I want to contrast that to one of the first Arab comics, Al Oulad, in 1923. Here we have a niqab as well, but it's not the punchline, it's not a joke that men are dressed in the niqab, it's a facet of normalcy. There you see the woman pushing her stroller in the background. Okay, so now that I've made you think that comics from the West are the worst, I'm going to try to make you think that there's actually room for conversation in that translation process. So in this, I go to Homie K Baba, not my Baba, a Baba. Um, <laughs> Homie K is a cultural theorist, and he, <laughs> um, he talks about uh, the third space. So in Homie K Baba's conception, cultures are porous, borders are not really defined, and when cultures are interacting, there's going to be something that happens in between them. And he calls this the in-between space or the third space. So in these in-between spaces of cultures, um, there are terrain for elaborating strategies of selfhood, singular or communal, that initiate new signs of identity, and innovative sites of collaboration and contestation, an act of defining the idea of society itself. So think back to that timeline I gave you. You can think of it as that weird space in between translated and original comics, the line, the dividing line. That's where these conversations are happening. Or else, elsewhere, think of it as one of those Mickey covers. So Mickey is a very fixed symbol in, in the United States and the Western um, marketplace. But when he's being brought into the Middle East, he becomes something new. Um, so I used to think of those images as grotesque, as hiding as the Trojan horse. But now you think of the Trojan horse as some, a site or a, a third space in between the cultures uh, where the same sign can be appropriated, translated, rehistoricized, and read anew. So in the spirit of reading anew and looking at how this can be a place between conversation between cultures, I want to look at three examples of that. First, Samir Magazine. So Samir Magazine is a really interesting case study. Um, it was founded by Nadia Nishat, uh, and here we have a quote from her on, in, in the issue, the founding issue. She says, we had to find a name for the magazine, and we decided to involve children in the choice by inviting them to a meeting. We held a vote, and the children chose the name Samir for the newborn. So here you have the intention of Samir Magazine, what's intended to be, and it's intended to be an Arab magazine, children's magazine of comics for the children. And this is in the 50s. So here's an example of an anniversary issue. You see the fully Arab staff in Cairo that are involved in producing um, Samir Magazine and hard at work. And the interesting thing about Samir Magazine, it wasn't just original comics. In fact, it was translated comics and original comics living side by side. So if you look in the top right of this, you can see Tintin waving his chapeau, um, as well as characters. Some, a lot of these are the local characters from the comics, some other translations. You can see Jaha in the bottom middle on the right side of the screen. So you could flip a page and see tripped out versions of Tintin, and this is one of the first translations of Tintin. There was a previous version in the 40s, but this is the first colored translation of Tintin. Um, so you could see these versions of Tintin where it's translated, recolored, copied, pasted, but something is new here. Um, alongside original comics like Samir. So you're flipping the page and it's really a conversation between these two worlds. Here's an example of uh, Tonton on the cover of Samir. Again, like not, this is not an Urge drawing of Tintin. It's, it's kind of reimagining. And what I find really interesting about this is the resistance in translation. So remember that squiggle Arabic I was telling you about? That couldn't work in an Arab marketplace. So instead, um, it, was have, it had to be given new meaning and had to be given intentionality. So I, I look at this as a moment of contestation that Baba was talking about. And here you can see um, the dialogue change. So at the top is that original one we saw, and then this is the Arabic version. So we're going right to left now. You all know that. Um, so the by the beard of the prophet, that kind of crass reference gets changed to you won't escape, I'll get you this time. And again, that squiggle Arabic is actually given meaning. So here you have the translator 
you can't just copy and paste wholesale. There has to be a moment of dialogue within there. Second example I want to look at is Zizia Thompson and the idea of the Trojan horse, again, being a site of a way to hide imperialism. I want to look at the work of Zizia Thompson, a local uh, Lebanese artist who was in Cairo. Um, she started out in Samir. Um, so here's some of the drawings she did while at Samir magazine. Uh, she developed her aesthetic there. This was her first job uh, in, the, in the arts. Later, um, there's another example. These are the early, this is again in the 50s. So Samir magazine was the first place we saw Mickey. And Mickey's running till today in Egypt. But Mickey started popping up in Samir magazine and then eventually spun off into its own. And then so a lot of the people who worked in Samir magazine um, ended up doing those covers that we saw earlier. So Zizia Thompson was involved in that. Eventually, she went with the same publisher to Lebanon to start a magazine called Basat al Riyah in the 60s. So here she's the editor-in-chief of this new magazine after being a staff worker on Samir magazine. And again, that early work that she's doing translating um, Mickey's. And the kind of art that she does here is revolutionary. It shows children at play, very different than what you'd see. I if you remember from those Western comics, you don't see a lot of children, and they're definitely not at play. If anything, you just see these heavily dressed Arab men and, and their villainy. So here you see children at play having fun, and this is kind of uh, uh, unique, this was unique to her approach, Zizia. Um, so eventually, <laughs> that one's kind of creepy, with Santa peering in. Um, <laughs> eventually, Zizia uh, was really recognized by, by the West for the comics she was doing in the Middle East, and she took a job at Disney. So then Zizia, kind of counter to what we think about of the comics and how they travel and art, how it travels, theologically doing violence against the Middle East, Zizia's story is interesting because in the 70s, she moved to California where she still lives and started working for Disney as an animator. So here you have somebody who's doing these copy paste originally of Mickey Mouse, who's eventually moving backwards from what we think towards the hegemon and creating new ideas of Disney, original ideas, and being part of that. Um, and finally, I'll leave you with the idea of community building through institutions. So this is, I, this is more recent. This is what we're talking about now is taking place in comics. And the idea that um, there is a different dialogue happening now and translation really happens simultaneous to the creation. Um, so for this, initially I want to look at Samendal. Samendal is a Lebanese publication that was founded in 2006 and started publishing in 2007. Um, and Samendal is a really interesting comic. It's trilingual, but they also simultaneously translate themselves into each language. So they provide supplements of a completely Arabic version, of a completely French version, of a completely English version. And while you're reading this, it's engaging readers and inviting them to create comics. And it's explaining how this is from the inaugural issue translated into English by Samendal's staff. Um, explaining how you make a comic, what comics are, and they're inviting the readership to contribute and develop comics on their own and be a part of Samendal. So Samendal is also interesting in that they didn't just accept, ex uh, accept art from Middle Eastern artists, even though it's predominantly Arab artists. They accepted, artists from, they accepted art from creators in France and Belgium, and it's really a global dialogue in the style of Samir for a new generation. Elsewhere, we have the American University of Beirut, and they recently <coughs> launched uh, a, a Mataz and Rada Sawaf Arab Comics Initiative. So this is uh, a new comics initiative aimed at building community uh, and through, through doing original programming in the Middle East. And um, here is here's actually just happened recently, the Mohammed uh, Halil Award. Uh, you, they invited artists from all around the Middle East to contribute with a cash prize, you can see at the bottom, for different mediums. And it invited artists from diaspora in the region to kind of contribute and awarded them uh, the winner's money. And it kind of created this dialogue and a database of artists working today in the Middle East. Um, and finally, in that same model, we have the Cairo Comics Festival that just wrapped up in Cairo. And it's kind of doing the same thing in in. Egypt, inviting artists from the region to participate and awarding them prizes. So the way I see it now and the legacy of Arab comics is we really have much more space for 
conversation, and translation doesn't really happen in the same way it did, but where, where, where I used to be afraid that Western products preempted Arab, an original Arab voice by coming in very strong in the 60s, we now see that artists who were influenced by that model, like Samandal is an anthology, just like many Western comics are, um, the Cairo comics aesthetics of this are very, you know, influenced by growing up in, in, in like, as a fan of Western comics. Um, we see that people who are influenced by these are able to create a new community in the Middle East now. And it's, it's, I think it's great, and I'm looking forward to what comes next. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I actually grew up reading Miki and Samir. Akit. Does anybody here uh, used to read Miki and Samir? Yeah, see? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Does anybody have any questions? What's the origin of uh, Tehteh? Of Tenten? Tehteh. Tehteh. Yeah. Samir. What's, I don't know. I, what's I, the history of Tehteh? So, so actually, this is actually a problem in my own research yes. is that so many people that are involved in the publishing and really in the Nasser era of, of comics Egypt. creation and yeah. of Egypt and pan-Arabism, which you see a lot of these images referencing, they, they weren't allowed to write their names attached to it, typically. So every <coughs> artist I found subsequently, and I'm glad we're kind of in a space <coughs> now where we can appreciate the artists that we're creating at the time who were mostly anonymous. So I have no idea where the name is, and if anyone does, that would be like a great... Tete. Tete. It doesn't exist in the common... No, it doesn't. Yes. Um, but like an anecdote related to that is like Lulu and Tabush, you know, so many people think it's an uh, original Arab creation, but it was actually a translation. Um, and I talked to the editor of it. She's the same person who translated the Superman. Uh, she's in Lebanon, Illustrated Publications, Leila Shaheen. And she was so adamant about finding a name that would work for the same character in Arabic. So it became Lulu and Tabush. And it, so, so many people, she, she thinks her greatest success is that people think it was an original Arab comic book, that it wasn't a translation. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Nadim, for your great intervention. Uh, I recently, I was uh, in, when they opened the Cerso, there was uh, something about um, the Samandal, and mm -hmm. they were sued because they posted uh, some political message which wasn't very appreciated, and they had to shut it down, and there was a Kickstarter campaign mm -hmm. to I think the, um, how much was it, the fine, around $40,000? Yeah, 30000 30000 yeah. yeah. Did they ever manage to...? So that's actually a great question, and it's a, it's a good plug for Samandal. Uh, they, so it's been a long process, but about five years ago, in their third, third or fourth issue, they published a comic that was um, considered sacrilegious by the Lebanese censors um, against Christianity. And they got sued, and they got sued in this really crazy way where it wasn't the artists that were responsible, it, it, be, it became the publishers, and not all the publishers, but three of the publishers. And they, instead of getting the one-time fine of like 7,500 uh, US dollars, they, three of them got it. So it's just, it's an absurd miscarriage of justice, and the, all the while, you know, they think that it's gonna work out in their favor because it's so bizarre that it's happening this way. But unfortunately, they did get sued, and now they're doing a fundraising to be able to keep Smendel going on Indiegogo. And I really encourage everyone to go uh, Google it, check it out, and support Smendel if you can, or tell people about it if you can, because it's, it's a super important legacy, and Smendel has really influenced a whole new generation of anthology comics. We have Tok Tok in um, Egypt, and La Fierie de Glandeur in Lebanon as well. All these different comics magazines that were really uh, influenced by Samendel and it created a, a unique model. So I really encourage everyone to go check that out and see that story. Hey. Hi, first of all, fantastic presentation. Thank well, you. Well done, well done. Um, I'm curious, um, I know like your presentation mainly focused on how Western comics were translated for Arab audiences, but I'm curious, have you ever gotten the chance to see how the Japanese manga has been like translated or yeah. influenced like, uh, uh, like Arab comics? And yeah, so, there's... Any, uh, how? Or yeah, there's a, there's a great case study for that. It's called Gold Ring. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, it's a creator, uh, Case Sudki, out of the Emirates. And he was like really influenced by manga growing up, and he decided to create a comic about falcon falconry uh, the, in the style of manga. And he actually hired a Japanese artist to do it uh, from a well-known manga. I don't, I'm not so familiar with manga. 
But um, it's actually it's super interesting because it tells the story of falconry and this young boy discovering his falcon in a manga style. Yeah, yeah, and it's in, it's in Arabic, and now he started translating it to English. So there you go, it's like every which way. And then um, the more recent model of that is uh, Lena Merhej, uh, her comic just got translated into French. You're seeing the Arab of the future just got translated to English from Arabic. So there's an increasing kind of pushback as there's more graphic novels and the way that they understand them in the West of comics moving back into English and back into the West for those audiences. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of fascinating to see that. And then, of course, artists who are in diaspora, uh, such as Marjane Satrapi and, and, and those type, who are creating for an audience, their intended audience, is a French marketplace about the Iranian, her Iranian history. Or 99 that was... Uh, the 99, exactly. Illustrated yeah. by the uh, Marvel... Uh, yeah, it was illustrated by his connections with uh, Dr. Naif, his connections in the United States yeah. with Marvel. And so they illustrated it, even though it's a story about the 99 names of Allah, yep. uh, and they each have a different embodiment, and it's very in the superhero vein, the Superman vein. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, hi. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? <laughs> I have a story. Um, a like 20 years ago, um, I was illustrating these books for an organization, and they wanted me to do um, take one of the characters I did um, as a logo for this upcoming children's uh, book convention. So um, one of the characters I chose was a mouse. It was a cute little mouse. And they're like, well, we can't use a mouse for the logo because they're very stigmatized, you know, they're mice. I'm like, well, Mickey Mouse is a mouse. So one woman goes, oh, Mickey Far. <laughs> and I was like, they, they allowed this mouse into their homes without realizing and studying what the thing uh -huh. actually was. And I thought that was interesting that they didn't know that Mickey Mouse was a mouse. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I, the, you've heard of the fatwa of, uh, that Mickey Mouse is uh, the agent of the devil and must be executed. Yeah, I don't know. Poor Mickey's got a bad rap here, yeah. you know? So <laughs> I don't know. So I just thought yeah, that was interesting. No, that's great. I actually like that uh, there's an artist in Egypt working now who calls him Mickey Musser. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I love that, like that whole era of those translated comics and, and him. I don't know, maybe he blended so well. You're just like, no, he's, I mean, he he's an Arab dude. Good, yeah. So yeah, exactly. Hi. Uh, great talk. Hey, thank you. Uh, I was wondering if uh, when the Arab content was being developed, we saw how they sort of uh, reappropriated the Orientalism, mm -hmm. but I wondered if there was ever, ever um, this Occidentalist rhetoric that happened with the newly Arabic uh, material. Like, if they ever had this weird, uh, most racist uh, outlook to the West, if that was ever like uh, oh man, I this, so I had to drop the last part, which is about this artist named Hussein Bakar, and he was he was the he was he's really known as a modern artist, but simultaneously in the 50s he was part of the Society of the Post Orientalists, and it's this fascinating it's like a fascinating tidbit. So it was a bunch of artists in Egypt who joined together, and they're like, look, we can't escape the fact that we were trained in like the French style and all that. All we can do right now is say like screw that, like we're gonna do our own thing. And we're, so his magazine he started was called Sindabad. So he's like, okay, this is an original property. Like this is not in, it's not tainted with being from the West. And it was like an all Arab staff and they just were like focused on creating original stories that like painted the West in like, a, like in a really kind of, I'd, I'd argue racist way. There's, there's also this uh, comic called Zakia out of the Emirates, which was also a Nasserist who moved post Nasser to the Emirates, and Zakia is like this really whip-smart girl who's teaching like the children in her class about different history. And there's one issue that's like about the KKK in the United States and like how it's the most scary thing and like never go to the United States because they'll hang you. So it's like it, there is like moments of that like of resistance and actually more aggressive outwards. Like yeah, it's but I really like the Society of the Post Orientalists because it's like we can't escape the fact that we've been influenced by the West. We could just choose to use these tools to tell new stories. Cool, thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Nadim, hey. for um, this wonderful talk that you've given us. I was thinking specifically about kind of what you shared and it being this kind of abstract in-between space of translation from English to Arabic and kind of the, the references and connotations that these mm -hmm. might have. 
Um, I was specifically struck with the slide that you had with the English being the first of the, the beard of the prophet. Mm -hmm. And then two boxes later, there's the gibberish Arabic that yep. then becomes actual Arabic. And what called my attention, of course, was when you said, now we're reading you know, right to left, left to right kind of thing. Yeah. And I was wondering that, you know, these characters that work for probably some media magazine that are kind of making these changes and doing these things, were there any kind of other conventions or other, other ways that these in-between characters had some kind of authorship in the reconfiguration of, you know, inhabiting the space of, of the sheet of the comic? You know, were there mm -hmm. instances that, you know, blocks were moved around or pages were mirrored, you know, to right. say that, were there any of these findings that were more kind of less language based but more visual and spatial? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and, and what I always think of with that is Baba again has a quote where it's, it's about colonial mimicry. So, as you're colonized, you're going to recreate the language of your oppressors. So, try and understand comics in that lens. And he talks about how when you recreate your oppressor's language, it's almost the same but not white. So it's like, it's never going to, like, not quite is the play on that. It's just, like, not going to be the same. And I always think of not only, like, like those, those bubbles and, and things like that and the squiggle Arabic, but Superman, uh, when he's translated, I, I can't go back to it now, but um, the S is always inverted. So it's, like, it's never the right way. So it's, like, but it wouldn't make sense unless you had literacy to understand it from, an, like, from the American Western perspective. It's just, but it's just random. And then the Iraqi Superman is the weirdest thing. They gave him a mustache, and instead of the S, they put a lantern there. And it's just like, it's, it's really bizarre. And then the last point I make to that is, th the reason I get kind of, why I saw it as a violence originally is because the early comics that were happening weren't in the same style as the European and Western comics. When you saw uh, Arab artists trying to figure out how to tell sequential art, which is what we call comics, mm -hmm. They were doing like really loose bubbles, like not really panels, and it kind of flowed more like the Arabic text. And so for me, it's just like, it, it's, it's hard to see that when it's translated over, um, and then you kind of lose that thread of history of what could have been, and what kind of aesthetic would we have had that would be different in the same way manga is different. Um, and we just never quite had enough isolation to, to see that through. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Nadim. Big thank you. Guys. Vote. Yeah. I, thank it. you very much. Um, I'll talk to you. Yeah. Oh, okay. sorry. Yeah. Um, like, I was just wondering, going back to the beginning of your talk. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, where you, you know, where you talked about the different types of the, like, the Western comics of Superman and Astro Boy and uh, Tintin. So, were you able to kind of get a grip on who is this quintessential Arab comic character? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and for me, going, going back to what I was saying earlier, it would be Sindbad, because it is, like, when you look at the history of Sindbad and how it's traveled through folklore, through uh, poetry, through literature, in so many different ways, it made natural sense that that was going to be our, our kind of character, that it is originally created here, and, and Sindbad did have a long run. So um, this kind of journey character? Yeah, and it... Like right. Like the Arabian Nights, right, yeah. And, and, and it's exactly in the same model of Tintin. Like, they created Sindbad with a little dog, like a cute little dog. And Sindbad's traveling the world as an Arab, though, and, like, having these Arab relations to the rest of the world. And, but it's hard, because, as with all art in the Middle East, it's so diffused. And you talk to Kyrene about it, and they'll definitely say it's Sindbad. And you'll talk to, like, a Lebanese, and they'll probably, like, root for Lulu. It's just, like, it's so, it's so spread out, and it's so diverse. Um, and that's why, like, kind of the area I look at most is that kind of pan Arab time when you're trying to create comics that unite the entire Middle East. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you.